Boldwood presents Christmas Miracles at Hedgehog Hollow. Written by Jessica Redland and read by Leslie Harcourt and Emma Swan. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. The story so far. After discovering that Hedgehog Hollow's bank account had been emptied, Samantha and Josh's wedding plans looked shaky. But the generosity of the local community and their good friend Terry helped save the rescue centre and Samantha and Josh said I do. Josh's Auntie Lauren was delighted for the happy couple. But the wedding made her reflect on her own two divorces and her decision to remain single. While Samantha and Josh were on honeymoon, Lauren received the shock news that the job she loved would soon disappear in a work restructure. Her future career wasn't the only source of confusion, with Lauren finding herself drawn to Riley Berry, the man who'd given her the redundancy news. Lauren's past returned to haunt her when her first husband, Sean, made contact 26 years after walking out on her. She agreed to meet him and discovered the reason he'd left, which gave her closure and helped her move forward. Riley was exceptionally supportive during this time, and Lauren finally felt ready to love again. Samantha had told Josh on their wedding day that she was ready to start a family, but had a panic attack on honeymoon when she thought she might be pregnant. Back home, she was on edge until Lauren convinced her to tell Josh so they could face it together. Josh was as supportive as ever, but when Samantha found out that she wasn't pregnant, she felt disappointed and began to wonder if she might be ready for a baby after all. Terry brought an injured fox cub to the rescue centre, prompting Fizz to share that her dream job was to work full-time in a rescue centre. Samantha wasn't opposed to extending their work beyond hedgehogs, but said there wasn't the staff or funds to do so. Keen to show her gratitude to Samantha for welcoming Darcy and her to Hedgehog Hollow, Accountancy whiz Phoebe showed Samantha and Josh the financial viability of running a larger operation with paid staff. A few months later, Hedgehog Hollow played host to another wedding when Josh's mum Connie married Alex. So many of Samantha's friends and family had now found happiness. But there were a couple more people Samantha felt deserved to find their happy ever after. It's now October, one year later. And a lot has happened at Hedgehog Hollow. Chapter One Samantha I opened my eyes with the first gentle beeps of the alarm clock, pressed the snooze button, and settled back under the duvet. Josh snuggled up against me and lightly kissed the top of my shoulder, stirring the butterflies in my stomach. Happy birthday, Sammy he said, trailing his kisses up my neck. This is how all birthdays should start. I adjusted positions so his lips could touch mine. Actually, it's how every day should start. That can be arranged. Oh, my hands flew to my stomach. That was a big one. Someone's awake? I guided Josh's hands so he could feel it too. We might have a footballer in there, he said, laughing as the baby kicked once more. Or a martial arts expert. Just think, next time either of us celebrate a birthday, we'll be parents. I entwined my fingers round Josh's. Only 12 weeks to go. It's getting very real now. How are you feeling? I squeezed his hand. Still in a good place. I'd initially struggled with the idea of becoming a parent, fearful of having the same difficult relationship with my child that I'd had with my own mum, a combination of discovering that my mum's behaviour arose from a shocking incident in her past rather than being my fault, counselling support, and building a fresh relationship with mum had helped allay my fears. When Josh and I were both ready to try for a family, it didn't happen immediately. Each month that passed brought fresh disappointment. But looking back, that extra time worked out for the best, 
because there'd been so much work to do in progressing our plans to expand Hedgehog Hollow into a wider wildlife rescue centre. At the start of this year, Hedgehog Hollow Wildlife Rescue Centre was established as the charitable division of Alderson and Wishaw Veterinary Practice in which Josh and Dad were partners. Fizz was now qualified as a veterinary nurse and we were both salaried. Having Fizz working full-time and the additional flexibility to draft in staff from the practice had eased the pressure on me. In early December, I'd be stepping back and going on maternity leave. In theory. We all knew that I wouldn't be able to resist spending time in the barn helping out until Bublet arrived. Bublet being Darcy's name for the baby. A combination of hoglet and baby. Organising the nursery was the project for the half-term holiday the week after next, and once that was done, what else would there be for me to do but sit and wait for the little one to make an appearance? Might as well make myself useful in the barn. Darcy and Phoebe were both so excited about having a baby in the house once more. It was mid-October now, 16 months since Josh's dad Paul and his family had moved into Alder Lee, the house at the veterinary practice and we all still missed having Lottie and her older brother Archie around for regular cuddles. Do you still think you know Bublet's gender? Josh asked as the baby kicked again. Yes, but you're not getting it out of me. Wait until the 4th of January or whenever they appear, and at that point, I'll tell you if I was right. You're such a spoil sport. I laughed at his childish whine, knowing he was joking really. We'd made a joint decision not to find out the gender, eager to enjoy that special moment of surprise when Bubbler arrived. I'd best get over to the barn to give Dad a hand, I said, reluctantly pushing back the duvet. Dad had been on overnight hoglets duty. Hedgehogs typically produce a first litter of hoglets in the spring following post-hibernation mating. But there's a second round of births, autumn juveniles, in September and October. As with the spring births, this resulted in a phase of hand-rearing the tiny hoglets who'd been abandoned. So Josh, Dad, Fizz and I took it in turns to stay in the barn and feed them overnight. I'll do that, Josh said. Why don't you have a lion and a long shower? A lion would be amazing, but there's no chance of me getting back to sleep with Bublet doing their morning workout. The long shower sounds good, though. Phoebe and Darcy should be up by the time we're done in the barn so we can give you your presents. Josh kissed me again, then slipped into the ensuite to brush his teeth and freshen up while I rolled myself off the bed and padded over to my cheval mirror. Each time I caught sight of my reflection, the baby bump still took me by surprise. I lowered the waistband on my pyjama shorts and lifted up my t-shirt so I could see it more clearly. How are you doing in there, Bublet? I asked. The reply came in the form of another kick. I still had moments when the responsibility of raising a little human felt overwhelming, but I knew that was completely normal from conversations with Chloe, Hannah and Beth. Josh had moments too, which gave me reassurance that we were in every part of this together. I'd only just pulled on my maternity leggings and a tunic top, when I heard giggling outside the bedroom door. Happy birthday, Phoebe and Darcy cried when I opened it. Phoebe was holding a tray containing tea in my favourite hedgehog mug, a couple of warm pan of chocolates, which smelled delectable, a bowl of chopped fruit and a pot of yoghurt. Thank you, that looks delicious. I settled onto the bed and Darcy snuggled up beside me. Phoebe was about to pass me the tray, but we both started laughing, realising that eating off a tray while pregnant wasn't going to work. I'll just pop it on here, she said, clearing some space on my bedside drawers for the tray, then perching on the end of the bed. Misty Blue, my grey and white tabby cat, jumped up, closely followed by her best friend Luna, a black stray who'd become our pet last year after being found on Fizz's brother's farm, Bumblebee Barn, feeding some abandoned hoglets. We hadn't been sure if Luna would adjust to life inside, but she spent more time indoors than Misty Blue did, 
usually curled up on Darcy's bed on the top floor of our three-storey farmhouse. How are you feeling about the shorter hair? I asked Phoebe. She ran her fingers through the sleek shoulder-length cut, which accentuated her high cheekbones. It'll take some getting used to, but it's going to be a lot easier to manage for work. I'd only ever known her with long hair, but she'd had it all cut off after work last night, and I couldn't help thinking that removing the curtain of hair was also a statement about how far she'd come, completing her amazing transformation since moving into Hedgehog Hollow almost two years ago. She'd finished college last year and secured her job as a trainee accountant, and now I hardly recognised the shy, nervy student in the woman before me. With only a few months until her 21st birthday, her confidence had blossomed. She was excelling at work, had been fast-tracked onto the next level of accountancy exams, and it was wonderful to see her developing friendships. Darcy had changed too. She'd always been confident and bubbly, but she'd carried an air of loneliness which had thankfully eased as she settled into her new school and started making friends, attending after-school clubs, something she'd never been given the opportunity to do in her old life, had made a massive difference. She went to ballet, street dancing, judo and the cub pack run by my in-laws, Connie and Alex. Making more friends at each club, that loneliness had well and truly disappeared. And I was confident that Darcy's childhood memories would be happy and positive, having escaped from the Grimes family before they'd inflicted any lasting damage. Happy birthday, Poppet, Dad said, returning with Josh when I was in the lounge with Phoebe and Darcy a little later. Dad kissed me on the cheek, then drew me into one of his bear hugs. Can't believe my little girl is 32. It seems like no time since I was in my early 30s. I'm getting old. You don't look old, Grandpa Jonathan, Darcy said, earning her a hug from Dad too. Not like Grandpa Terry. Dad laughed. That's good to hear, because Terry's 25 years older than me. He pointed to the pile of gifts in front of the log burner. Are those for me? Darcy squealed and dived for the pile of gifts. They're Samantha's. This one's from me, she said, holding out a soft package wrapped in hedgehog wrapping paper. I carefully peeled back the tape and removed a pair of black dungarees with a mother hedgehog, Hoglet and wild flowers embroidered on the bib, and the words bublet on board. Oh, they're gorgeous. Thank you, Darcy. I stood up and held the dungarees against me. I asked Auntie Chloe to make them for you. She's very clever. She certainly is. Chloe had become quite the sewist since making the first batch of crafts for our family fun day last year. I'm excited about making a Christmas wreath. Darcy said, as I folded up the dungarees. We were going out for a meal tonight with friends and family, but a smaller group were spending the day at Crafty Hollow making Christmas wreaths with cream scones for lunch provided by Fizz's mum, Natasha. Crafty Hollow was the crafting school Lauren and Chloe had set up together in the old stables beyond Wildflower Byer. The conversion had been complete in time for tours and demonstrations at our family fun day in late June, and the first few months had gone really well. Lauren and Chloe would be announcing details of their Christmas-themed workshop soon, and we were getting our very own sneak preview today. Darcy handed me another gift, then another, until the pile was gone, and I was surrounded by gorgeous presents, including more clothes, scented candles, perfume, jewellery and books. I'm feeling very spoilt, I said. Thank you all very much. I think I'll change into my new dungarees and then we'll head down to Crafty Hollow. It was a beautiful autumn day with clear cornflower blue skies but a nip in the air holding the promise of winter. Birds chirped in the trees and I like to think it was a special birthday chorus for me. Darcy blew kisses to the animals as we passed the rescue centre and giggled as she kicked her way through a trail of fallen orange and brown leaves. I still hadn't decided which season I loved the most at Hedgehog Hollow, 
as each brought fresh colours, new sounds and such beauty. I stroked my hand over my bump, smiling contentedly. It was definitely a happy birthday so far. Chapter 2 Samantha Crafty Hollow could probably have opened for business sooner than June, but Chloe and Lauren had wanted to think carefully about what sort of crafts they'd offer and how they wanted to use the space. Fizz's architect friend Robbie had done such a great job designing the holiday cottages that they'd been keen to use him, and what they'd created together was so impressive. The upstairs was used for material-based crafts like sewing, quilting, needle felting, knitting and crocheting, with the ground floor devoted to bigger and messier activities such as art, upholstery and mosaic making. On the ground floor, one side still had individual stables, beautifully retaining the building's equestrian origins, each housing the materials and equipment needed for different crafts. Chloe and Lauren had already developed so many skills and they kept learning new ones to add to their offering. They'd also partnered with a guest art tutor. Javine Defoe had been the head of art and design at Redfield Tech until a restructure last spring. She'd taken redundancy, just like Lauren, and ran art workshops at Crafty Hollow alongside running her own art gallery. Looks like everyone's here before us, I said, recognising the various cars in the car park. I pushed open the door and squealed as party poppers sounded and paper streamers were tossed towards me. Giant number three and two helium balloons stood on a table with a colourful balloon bouquet, along with a stack of gifts. You weren't meant to be getting me presents, I gently reprimanded them. You deserve it, Chloe said. I worked my way around the group with hugs and kisses. Knowing how desperate Darcy was to get started, I suggested opening my gifts when we broke for lunch. Chloe handed out mocktails and asked the guests to find a seat. I sat at the largest table with Mum, Auntie Louise, Hannah and Rich. Fizz, Phoebe, Beth and Natasha were on the table beside us, leaving the third one for Rosemary, Celia, Darcy and Beth. Good morning, ladies and gent, Lauren called once we'd all settled. Everyone smiled in Rich's direction and he did a bow. A very warm welcome to Crafty Hollow for a special wreath-making workshop in celebration of Sam's birthday. Lauren paused for whoops. Chloe and I are going to demonstrate some of the techniques you'll need today, but don't worry if you don't take it all in, as we'll come round the tables. One of the many fabulous things about crafts, Chloe said, is that what you create is completely unique to you. We've prepared some sample wreaths, which you can copy, use for inspiration, or completely ignore. As Chloe spoke, Lauren held up different Christmas wreaths, showing a variety of styles and colours. On your tables, Chloe continued, you'll find the basic wreath and the equipment you need to decorate it. She named each item as Lauren held them up. Lauren pointed to some tables laid down one side of the room. Over there, you'll find crates full of materials like artificial holly, poinsettias, pine cones and a selection of other Christmas goodies. So have a good rummage and find what speaks to you. We want you all to go home with something you love. If there's something you'd like which isn't there, do ask, as we may well have it, Chloe added. And if you add something to your wreath and decide it's not quite right, it's easily removed. It was such a delight to see Lauren and Chloe in full teaching mode. Their passion shone brightly, and I loved how they worked as a double act. I'd never have predicted that they'd form such a strong friendship and end up in business together. We gathered round their table while they did a couple of demonstrations, sharing tips on how to attach the materials securely and lay them out to the best effect. Over to you, Lauren said, smiling round the group. Check out the crates, and as it's only ten weeks until Christmas and we're doing Christmas crafts, I think you'll forgive us for putting on a Christmas playlist. I hung back with Hannah while everyone dived for the crates. How are you feeling? I asked her. She placed her hands on her baby bump and rolled her eyes. Enormous. I saw my midwife yesterday. I'm booked in for a C-section on Wednesday, but 
I'm hoping he'll put in an appearance before then. Hannah and Toby were expecting a boy, and three-year-old Amelia couldn't wait to have a little brother to boss about. It had been lovely being pregnant at the same time as Hannah, and it was exciting to think that our children would go to school together and hopefully be the best of friends like us. Mum, Auntie Louise and Rich returned with a selection of materials, so Hannah and I went to explore. As I passed Rosemary and Celia's table, it warmed my heart to see Chloe sitting with them, asking Rosemary for her ideas and handing her different materials to touch. I tuned in to what she was saying as I hovered by the crates. This is so kind of you, my dear, Rosemary said. I assumed I'd just be helping Celia. Wreath making is a great craft for the visually impaired because it's very tactile, so your fingers can do the work instead of your eyes. We can help with any really fiddly bits, but I'm certain you're going to produce something spectacular. Tears rushed to my eyes. Pregnancy hormones making me cry at everything these days. And Hannah patted my arm and touched her heart. Chloe was like a different person these days. Or rather, she was consistently the lovely person I knew she could be, instead of the self-centred, selfish Chloe who'd emerged far too often. Hannah had admitted recently how much she liked her now, which was great to hear. Toby and James were best friends, so Hannah hadn't been able to avoid Chloe, but had really struggled with her presence at first. I decided to make a wreath which blended Christmas and autumn with pine cones, berries, conkers, leaves and fruit. Auntie Louise and Rich were both going all out Christmas with poinsettias, holly and berries. Mum had selected pastel pinks, greens and creams, and Hannah had chosen dried orange segments and cinnamon sticks. My thoughts didn't usually turn to Christmas until well after my birthday, but I felt so Christmassy right now, surrounded by all the glitter and sparkle and with seasonal music playing. There was a large tree by the entrance which Lauren and Chloe had put up at the start of the month to encourage customers to think about booking Christmas workshops. Christmas bunting and fairy lights were draped across the storage stables, and the whole atmosphere was warm and festive. Dave tells me that Orchard House is nearly finished now, Rich said to Mum. Mum had moved into the house in Little Tilbury last summer and had made amazing progress with the renovations. Rich's partner Dave had project managed the interior, while Mum developed the extensive gardens. She'd loved her first year at Agricultural College and was planning to set up her own landscape gardening business when she finished her course. There's just the ensuite in the master bedroom to finish, Mum said, and then that's all the major work done. Your Dave and his team are brilliant. I'm so thrilled with their work. Rich glowed with the compliment. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Lauren joined us. I love seeing what everyone chooses, she said, looking at the materials we'd picked. They're all going to be beautiful. What's your favourite craft? Hannah asked her. I love them all, and I never in a million years imagined I'd say that. Who knew there was a closet crafter inside me? At a push, maybe mosaics or stained glass. There's something really special about taking what appear to be broken bits and turning them into something whole. A metaphor for life, I think. I was pretty sure from the wide smile and the sparkle in her eyes that she was thinking about the broken heart she'd nursed ever since her first husband walked out on her with no explanation. Now she knew what had happened. They'd become friends once more, and she'd found love with Riley. They were such a great match. How are you enjoying life on the farm? Mum asked. It's the stuff of dreams, Lauren said. I get to wake up to stunning views every day, and then I come to work here, and it's a different set of stunning views. I'm very lucky. Lauren had moved into the most gorgeous farmhouse, Briar Ridge, with Riley and his 12-year-old son, Kai. It was a similar setup to Hedgehog Hollow, where most of the land was rented and farmed by a neighbouring farmer, leaving the farmhouse, gardens, a meadow and an orchard for them to maintain. Lauren chatted to us a little longer and gave us a few more tips before moving on to the next table. The stables were alive with chatter, singing and laughter, and I couldn't imagine a better way to spend my birthday. 
Chloe sat down beside Darcy, who was unsurprisingly creating a pink wreath. I couldn't hear what Chloe was saying, but I didn't miss the squeal of delight when Chloe handed her a sparkling unicorn to attach to it. Fizz, who was wearing a Christmas jumper with a sequin pug in antlers on the front, was saying something to Phoebe and Natasha, which had them all in fits of giggles. Fizz's girlfriend Yasmin had been invited, and I couldn't help feeling guilty at how relieved I'd been when Fizz told me that Yasmin would join us for the evening meal only. I found Yasmin hard work, but Fizz's parents, Natasha and Hadrian, seemed to really like her, so I wondered if it was just me. Could I have unwittingly given off a vibe which made her feel uncomfortable in my presence? Wishful thinking on my part to see Phoebe and Fizz together because, in my mind, they were infinitely better suited? Watching Phoebe and Fizz together now couldn't be more different to seeing Fizz with Yasmin. The bubbly, laughing Fizz was the one we knew and loved, but she always seemed on edge around Yasmin. Fizz sometimes joked about how refreshing it was that Yasmin didn't try to change her like her ex-girlfriend Nadine had, but I wasn't convinced that was true. Fizz's outward appearance had remained the same, bright, sparkly, unicorn-themed clothes and colourful hair, a purple ombre look being her latest. But there was a behavioural change which had surfaced a couple of months into their relationship. An hour into our wreath-making, I went to make myself a mug of fruit tea, and Rich joined me in the small kitchen. Have you decided what colour to paint the nursery? He asked, pouring himself a coffee. No, I've narrowed it down to four colours, but I keep changing my mind on which I like best. We're getting some sample pots next weekend, and I hope seeing them on the wall will help me decide. It should do. He stirred in some milk. I have some news for you. Dave and I have decided to move house. Really? Not out of the area? Definitely not. We love it here. We want somewhere bigger because we'd like to become dads. Oh my gosh! Rich, that's amazing news. But I didn't think you were interested in having children. We weren't, but, you know, you get a bit older and your friends start having kids and you get a different outlook on life. We haven't decided whether we want to foster, adopt or go down a surrogacy route, but we've been talking about it for months and we're certain it's what we want. You can tell Josh, but we're not sharing it with anyone else just yet. I'll keep quiet. I put my drink down and hugged him. I'm so excited for you. You'll both be amazing, dads. I wasn't just saying that. Darcy adored them and they'd always been brilliant with Josh's young half-siblings, Archie and Lottie. Thank you. As we took our drinks back to the table, I couldn't stop smiling at the prospect of another expansion to the Hedgehog Hollow family. There was a sudden clatter, making me jump, and a shout from Mum. Hannah was standing by her upturned chair, a pool of water on the floor. Guess I won't be needing that C-section on Wednesday she said, grimacing at me. I put my drink down as Rich righted the chair and gently eased Hannah into it. Any contractions? I asked. None so far. Oh, spoke too soon. She scrunched up her face and gripped the table, waiting for the sensation to pass. I glanced at her phone in front of her. It's 11.11, nice and easy to remember. How about you call your midwife and I'll give Toby a ring? The volume of the music lowered. Everyone, Chloe called. Why don't we give Hannah some space and go on a little tour upstairs? I can show you some of the Christmas crafts we've been preparing. I gave her a grateful thumbs up as everyone was ushered away. Lauren brought a pile of towels over and dropped a couple on the floor. How are you feeling, Hannah? Okay, bit embarrassed doing that in front of everyone. We all assured her there was no need to be. It's a natural part of pregnancy, and every woman's experience is different, Rich said gently. It's a slow trickle for some, and like floodgates opening for others. It was a trickle with Amelia, but trust me to be floodgates this time when I'm out. She picked up her phone, and I grabbed mine to make the call to Toby. I walked away from the table as the phone rang out. 
tutting as it went to voicemail. Hi, Toby, it's Samantha. Hannah's waters have just broken and she started her contractions. She's on the phone to her midwife now, but you might want to drive over here in case... A cry from Hannah stopped me mid-sentence. Another contraction, Rich called to me. Four minutes apart. Toby, scrub that, I said. You definitely want to drive over now. Baby's on his way. Don't worry about Amelia. We'll look after her as planned. Rich was looking at his watch as Hannah gripped the table once more. You're doing great. Four minutes apart, lasting longer than 60 seconds, which means baby's going to put in an appearance a little sooner than we thought, but you're a nurse, we have two former nurses here, and I'm a paramedic, so you're in very good hands. Are you comfortable with me doing an internal examination to check your cervix? Yes, that's fine. OK, I'll grab my medical bag from the car, but we could do with lying you down somewhere comfortable. There's a sofa in our office, Lauren said, pointing towards the door by the kitchen. Lauren and I linked arms with Hannah and helped her over to the office. Toby, she asked, voicemail, but I'll keep trying. Inside the office, Lauren laid a throw on the sofa. You might want to remove those wet leggings, can't be comfortable. While Lauren helped her out of her leggings and knickers, I rang Josh in the barn and asked him to bring my largest nightshirt and more towels as quickly as possible. Hannah was in the midst of another contraction when Rich returned. Lauren, can you take Hannah's pulse while I check how things are coming along, he said, helping Hannah lie down on the sofa after her contraction passed. I tried Toby again, but he was still on voicemail, so I sent him a text and WhatsApp message in the hope he'd pick one of them up soon. Seven centimetres dilated, Rich reported. It looks like things are moving along quickly. We're going to need to get you to hospital. Where were you? Another contraction stopped him mid-sentence, and he held Hannah's hand as she cried out in pain. Three minutes, Lauren said. Anything I can do to help? Mom asked, poking her head round the door. Rich was asking Hannah what had prompted the C-section for Amelia's birth, assessing the likelihood of her needing one for this birth, so I stepped outside. Yes, please, baby's on his way very quickly, we're about to call an ambulance, but there's a strong possibility of Hannah giving birth here. Can you ask Chloe to take everyone up to the farmhouse? Josh is on his way with towels. Can you watch out for him? OK, give Hannah my love. Back in the office, Lauren was on the phone to the emergency operator, and Hannah had changed position so that she was on all fours on the office floor. I tried Toby again, but it went straight to voicemail once more so I left another update before returning to Hannah. I don't think I'm going to finish my wreath today, she said ruefully, blowing her fringe out of her face. But you'll leave with an even more special creation, I said, smiling at her. And I won't ever forget this birthday. Chapter 3. Fizz We'd only been up at the farmhouse for 15 minutes when Chloe's phone rang. Darcy was sitting on the floor, absorbed by Saturday morning children's television, but the rest of us looked expectantly at Chloe. It's Sammy, she said, crossing her fingers and dipping out of the lounge. You could have heard a pin drop as we awaited the news. She was back a couple of minutes later, and the tense atmosphere lifted at her smile. He's here, and they're both doing well. Because he was born in the stables, they've named him Jesus. Phoebe and I glanced at each other, eyes wide. Then Chloe burst out laughing. Kidding! His name's Mason George Spears. He's eight pounds, two ounces, and they're on their way to the hospital now for a full check. But Sammy says that's just routine. Did Toby make it on time? Beth asked. Yes, but only just. He'd been in the middle of the supermarket with no signal and then, when he got to the till, all the messages came through so he had to abandon his trolley. Shortly afterwards, Josh arrived with Amelia and told us the ambulance had just arrived. Amelia seemed oblivious to the drama surrounding her brother's arrival as she settled in front of the TV with Darcy. Did you believe Chloe when she said they called the baby Jesus? Phoebe asked me a little later as we loaded the dishwasher after a round of drinks. A hundred percent! I didn't know what to say! Me neither. Mason's a cute name. It is, 
I can't believe what some people call their kids. I bumped into a lass I used to know from Young Farmers, and she's just had a girl. You'll never guess what she's called her. Peach. As in the fruit. Yep. Her full name's Peach Honey Rider. Phoebe scrunched up her nose. Ew. Sounds like a paint colour or a yoghurt flavour. I thought it sounded more like a porn star name. Oh my God, it does. Poor kid doesn't stand a chance. We were still giggling about some of the strange names people gave to their children as we left the farmhouse to walk back to Crafty Hollow. Yasmin would have hated that conversation. She didn't do jokes, banter or silliness, and she definitely didn't do toilet humour. Recently, she didn't do much humour at all. She was an artist and sculptor, working on several big commissions, and was under a lot of pressure at the moment, so I'd barely seen her, and when I did, there was tension. As soon as she'd met her deadlines, things would be back to normal. Hopefully. Mum had prepared an amazing spread for lunch. We had finger sandwiches, mini quiches, scones with jam and cream, and a selection of miniature cakes and pastries, including sugared doughnuts. I challenged the guests to try to eat the doughnuts without licking their fingers or lips, which had everyone laughing, and I took photos of everyone with sugary pouts. Another thing Yasmin would have hated. Phoebe and I helped Mum clear everything away, then returned to our wreaths. I'd gone for a fairly simple design. Yasmin wouldn't appreciate anything fussy on the door, so mine was nearly finished. Can I make another one? I asked Chloe. Obviously I'll pay you for it. Of course you can. Where are you putting them? We never use the front door, so this one's for the side door into the kitchen. But I thought I'd make a second one for Yasmin's studio. That's really sweet of you, Phoebe said smiling at me. I smiled back, even though I wasn't sure I was doing the right thing. Yasmin's house was at the end of a row of six former farm workers' cottages. It benefited from an enormous garden which wrapped around the turning circle at the end of the lane, and her studio was tucked away at the bottom of the garden. Originally a barn when the land was part of a farm, it had been in a state of disrepair, but Yasmin had it converted into a modern studio with a glass frontage to make best use of the light. The walls were white, and she kept it minimalistic, but if I didn't do anything fussy, a small wreath with muted colours, surely even she would like that. I was halfway through making Yasmin's wreath when she messaged me on WhatsApp. From Yasmin. Behind schedule, so I need to work tonight. Please let Sam know I'm not coming. My stomach sank. Again especially after she'd already declined the daytime invitation. You're seriously making Christmas wreaths in mid-October? She challenged when I invited her. Can't think of a worse way to spend a Saturday. You're on your own for that one. You'll come along for the meal, though. Do I have to? They're your friends, not mine. I don't drag you out to everything I do with my friends. Yeah, but I always come when you ask. Please, it's important to me. She'd agreed with a sigh on the proviso that I didn't try to talk her into the day do. I should have known she was going to pull out. Yasmin never did anything she didn't want to do. I'd told Sam that Yasmin would need to work today, so it wasn't implausible that she dropped out for that reason. I wished I didn't have to deliver that news yet again. Was this how it was always going to be with us? Yasmin doing her thing with her friends and me with mine? I wasn't the sort of girlfriend who wanted to be part of every aspect of my partner's life, but surely there should be some crossover. Bad news? Phoebe asked, her voice full of concern. Mum was looking at me with a frown on her face. I forced brightness into my tone. Yasmin's got a nightmare deadline and she's going to need to work tonight. Oh, that's a shame, Mum said. We haven't seen her in ages. She's so busy at the moment, which is great for her business, but not so great for the social life. Mum patted my arm. The challenges of being self-employed. You've got to take the work when it comes along. I'd better let Sam know. What I really wanted to do was go to the toilets and cry, but I wasn't going to let it get to me this time. Do you want me to let the pub know? I asked Sam after I'd given her the news. Thanks, but I'll do it. I was going to ring about Hannah and Toby anyway, so I'll reduce the booking by three. They won't mind. I hope she gets caught up soon. Sounds like she has a lot on. She does. She's hardly ever out of her studio at the moment. As soon as I said it, 
a wave of shame washed over me. She genuinely was snowed under, working very long hours, and I should be supportive of that instead of thinking badly of her for pulling out. I picked up a bottle of Yasmin's favourite cloudy apple juice on the way home and a box of her favourite chocolates. Even though I was dead chuffed with the wreath I'd made for her, I still wasn't sure it was the right thing. Her sneer at making wreaths in mid-October kept coming back to me, so I decided to leave it in my car and give it to her nearer Christmas. Or not at all. At least I knew I couldn't go wrong with apple juice and chocolates. The outside light came on when I pulled onto the drive, but the cottage was in darkness. I lifted my bag and the larger wreath out of the car and walked towards the kitchen door, listening carefully. If Yasmin's work was going well, I could usually hear soul music drifting up from her studio. But silence wasn't good. Jinx! I called, switching on the kitchen light. Where are you? Still holding my wreath, I nudged open the lounge door. My ginger cat was curled up in his bed in the darkness. Why couldn't she have left a lamp on for him? Hey, you, I said, placing everything down on the armchair. I've missed you. He yawned, stretched and padded over to me for a fuss. I picked him up and he lay in my arms like a baby while I stroked his white tummy. Let's get you some food. He leapt out of my arms and paced up and down beside his food bowl, mewing at me. I emptied a pouch into it and smiled at him, hoovering it up. But my smile slipped as I spotted the note from Yasmin on the worktop. In studio, don't disturb, enjoy your meal. That's me told, I said to Jinx, scrumpling the note up and tossing it into the recycling crate. I put her apple juice in the fridge and the chocolates on the side and started typing in a message on my phone to say I'd bought her some gifts. With a sigh, I deleted what I'd written and dropped my phone back in my bag. That would probably count as disturbing her. Best stick to my orders. Chapter 4. Samantha. From Hannah. I was hoping your birthday would be memorable, but probably not in that way. Hope everyone was okay with all the drama. We're on our way home now. Thanks so much for having Amelia overnight. Sorry to be missing your meal tonight. Have an amazing time. Kiss, kiss. To Hannah. Probably my most memorable birthday yet, and everyone's fine. It was an honour to see Mason come into the world and to share my birthday with him. Enjoy your first night together. Hugs to you all. Kiss, kiss. I shrugged off my dressing gown and pulled on the dress which Darcy had chosen this morning. A petrol blue wrap dress with large coral flowers on it. Josh appeared for his shower and paused by the door, smiling tenderly. You look incredible, Sammy. Thank you. I wish my feet weren't so swollen. Do you think I can get away with wearing slippers? I'd had a straightforward pregnancy so far. The nausea I'd experienced during my first trimester had eased by eating little and often and always having ginger biscuits and salty snacks to hand. I'd been tired, but not exhausted, so if swollen feet and ankles were all I experienced, I'd got off lightly and definitely couldn't complain. Hmm, as long as they're not in a clashing colour, he said, laughing. What about those? I nodded towards the enormous hedgehog-shaped slippers beside the bed, which Phoebe had given me last Christmas. It would certainly be a style statement, I dare you. Maybe I'm not quite at the fluffy slipper stage, but I think it's going to have to be flip-flops. I could brave bare feet tonight for the short walk to and from the jeep, but the temperature was dropping and I feared I might have to attempt to wear socks with my flip-flops in the future. Not easy with the toe post and definitely not stylish. Maybe the hedgehog slippers would be a better look. Happy birthday, dear Samantha. Happy birthday to you. It was loud and pitchy, but it made my heart happy to see so many friends and family gathered together just for me, including children, babies and a guide dog. There were 30 of us. The sparkler on the ice cream sundae in front of me fizzled out to cries of speech. I rolled my eyes, 
but obliged anyway. Thank you all for coming out tonight to celebrate my birthday. I really appreciate it. It makes me very happy to look round the table and see how much our Hedgehog Hollow family has grown. I glanced down at my stomach and continues to grow. I'd like to propose an extra special toast to the latest addition who clearly didn't get the memo that to be born in a stable he needed to arrive on Christmas Day. To Amelia's new baby brother, Mason George Spears. Everyone raised their glasses and repeated my toast. Enjoy your desserts, I said. As we finished eating, I smiled at Chloe and James seated opposite me as they attempted to clean two-year-old Samuel, who'd managed to smear ice cream across his face and hair. The pair of them seemed stronger and happier than ever. James was in complete remission, and village life had done wonders for both of them. Chloe finally had the friends and social life she'd dreamed of, as well as a thriving business. Chloe wiped her hands and passed me her phone. What do you think of this? Javine's just finished it, and she's offering it for auction at the Christmas fair, with all proceeds going to Hedgehog Hollow. I looked down at the most stunning painting of a hedgehog, badger, fox, hare and owl gathered round a roaring fire. Stockings hung from the mantelpiece, which had a Christmas tree on one side and a window on the other. Peeking through the window was a deer behind which stood a snowman. It's beautiful, and that's so generous. We've added another art workshop into the Christmas schedule, a hedgehog in a Christmas hat. I'll WhatsApp it to you when Javine sends it over. I couldn't wait to see it. Javine had created some stunning Christmas card designs, which we'd made available at the start of the month on the online shop, which Phoebe ran for me. But they'd sold out so quickly that we'd needed to get another batch printed. As well as Javine's art, we used the shop for the crafts that Lauren and Chloe made. Although there was only limited stock advertised at the moment, as they were building up their supplies for this year's Christmas fair in five weeks' time. There was nothing I personally needed to do for it, as that and the June family fun day were now Chloe, Lauren and Natasha's projects, leaving Fizz and me to completely focus on the part that excited us, looking after our animals. At the end of the table, Darcy and Kai were keeping Amelia entertained with a colouring book and some crayons, and she didn't seem bothered that she hadn't seen her parents all afternoon. She was my goddaughter and a regular visitor to Hedgehog Hollow, so it shouldn't be too strange for her spending the night with us. I'll made in home, lass. I looked up at my friend, 81-year-old Terry, and my stomach sank. Are you okay? I asked, concerned by the paleness of his cheeks and the dark bags under his eyes. Aye, just a bit tired. I've... Not been sleeping so well lately, and it's caught up with me. I stood up and hugged him. He felt thinner, and his cheek was cold against mine, making my stomach sink again. He normally had a good appetite, but I'd noticed he hadn't ordered a starter or dessert, and he'd only eaten half of his main course. I'll come and see you tomorrow, around late morning, so you can have a lie in. There's no need. He said. I won't take no for an answer. I'll bring some homemade soup over for your lunch. He gave me a weak smile. That'd be grand. Happy birthday, lass. Celia had driven him, so I said goodbye to her and Rosemary, and gave Trixie, Rosemary's guide dog, a stroke before she was clipped onto her working harness. Seventy-six-year-old Rosemary had been Phoebe's neighbour when she was younger, and had remained a close friend and valuable support after Phoebe's dad died. She now lived in a purpose-built bungalow in Fimberley, the same village as Terry, designed for those with reduced mobility. Earlier this year, her long-standing best friend Celia had moved in with her, a big relief for Phoebe, who had previously been worried about fiercely independent Rosemary being on her own. Rosemary clasped my hand and murmured, is Terry all right? I'm not sure. What makes you ask? He sounds different, tired, weary. He just told me he hasn't been sleeping well. 
And that's what he said to me too, and we both know Terry has never been a big sleeper, so I'm not buying it. I wasn't either. I'm taking some soup round tomorrow. I'll see what I can get out of him then, and I'll keep you posted. Terry was still on my mind when Josh and I got ready for bed later that evening, and I was about to ask Josh if he thought Terry looked ill, but my phone beeped with a WhatsApp notification. From Hannah. Forgot to attach a photo earlier. Mason says goodnight and happy joint birthday. Kiss, kiss. Oh, look! I sat on the edge of the bed, my eyes filling with tears at the photo of a red-faced baby with his eyes tightly shut and his tiny fists clenched against his lips. Where Amelia had inherited Hannah's dark hair, it looked like Mason was going to be auburn-haired like his dad. Josh scrambled across the bed and peered over my shoulder. Cute. I like the name Mason, too. Me, too. I'm glad it wasn't on our list, or I'd have been gutted. So it's a boy you think we're having, he teased. Could be, or that could be a double bluff. You're not going to get it out of me. Not even if I do this? He gently massaged my shoulders. Oh, that's good. But my lips remain sealed and don't you dare stop. Have you enjoyed your birthday? He asked. It's been the best. It really had been a wonderful day and such a special moment to be there for Mason's birth. I just hoped that Terry was all right. Chapter 5. Fizz. I'm so stuffed, Dad said as we wandered across the car park after Sam's birthday meal. I might not fit behind the steering wheel. Serves you right for having a sharing dessert all to yourself, Mum responded, giving him an affectionate prod to the stomach. I thought you were going to share it with me. I said I could probably manage a couple of spoonfuls, but that was it. Dad turned to me. I can't believe you didn't help me out either. Also full, I insisted. Salad isn't filling. It is when you have it with double chicken burger and chips. We arrived at Dad's car, and after a lot of huffing and puffing, he settled behind the steering wheel. Sam looked lovely tonight, I said once we'd set off. She did, Mum agreed. Pregnancy looks fabulous on her. I got chatting to Debs, and she's ever so excited about being a grandma for the first time. It was an obvious thing to say, and Mum wasn't the sort to question me or my older brother Barney, whether directly or subtly, about the chances of her becoming a grandparent one day, but considering I was now 28 and Barney was 30, she had to be wondering. Because I was. I gazed out of the window into the darkness, only half listening to my parents talking about the food and the conversations they'd had that evening. It's such a shame Yasmin couldn't make it tonight. Mum said as we headed into Little Tilbury. Do you think she'll make her deadline? She should do. She works well under pressure and she's never missed a deadline yet. The way Yasmin's projects came together at the 11th hour was awesome. She could work on a painting or sculpture for days and sometimes even weeks and it would look okay and then suddenly it transformed from okay to brilliant. You can drop me at the end of the lane, I told Dad. It'll be nice to have a blast of fresh air before bedtime. Appleby Lane was on the edge of the village. The two-bedroom, 200-year-old stone-built cottages had small front gardens surrounded by hedgerows and, on the other side of the lane, a hedgerow ran alongside a grassy meadow. Yasmin preferred ultra-modern houses with sharp lines and lots of glass, but there weren't many of those in the Wolves' villages, so she'd had to compromise on style. She regularly griped about the uneven walls, small windows and exposed beams, all the characterful elements which I loved, but she spent so little time in the cottage I'm surprised she even noticed it. Give Yasmin our love, Mum said as Dad pulled up at the lane end. I'm guessing she won't be joining us for Sunday lunch. I doubt it. I shuffled forward and gave them each a kiss on the cheek. See you at Barney's tomorrow. I waved and set off slowly down the lane, keeping my eye out for wildlife. A rustling to my right made me slow my pace further and I stopped completely, my heart melting as a large, rounded hedgehog emerged from the garden of number three, sniffed the air and crossed the lane, disappearing into the meadow. 
My night was made. I'd loved hedgehogs from the moment I met Gwendolyn Hedgehog Lady Mickleby, a friend of my grandparents when I was a young child. A combination of seeing how she helped sick and injured hedgehogs and spending so much time at our family farm had sent me down the route of wanting to help animals too, and I couldn't imagine ever tiring of seeing them in the wild. The gentle hoot of a long-eared owl a few paces later stopped me in my tracks once more, and I squinted into the trees. But there was little chance of seeing it in the darkness tonight, unless it took flight. There was a car parked outside our cottage, and I recognised it by the glow of the street lamp as belonging to Yasmin's best friend Ariana. Hopefully Ariana had just arrived for a fleeting visit, because if she'd been here all evening, I wouldn't be impressed when Yasmin had pulled out of the meal due to her workload. The lights on the car flashed, making me jump. Ariana's girlfriend Sarah Jade opened the gate and squealed as she spotted me. You scared the life out of me, Fizz, she said, clutching her heart dramatically. Sorry, will you survive? I joked. Just about. Sarah Jade removed a hoodie from the back seat and pulled it over her head. My fault for going along with Ariana's horror films fest every time we hit October. Can't stand the things. I'm jumpy all month. I can't do horror films either, I said, feeling her pain. I'd warmed to Sarah Jade as soon as I'd met her. She was warm, enthusiastic and fun to be around. I hadn't warmed to Ariana. She'd been Yasmin's bestie since their days at art college, and I got the distinct impression she tolerated my presence rather than enjoyed it. I was so relieved when Yasmin got in touch at the start of the week to invite us over, Sarah Jade said. Ariana had a nightmare on Elm Street evening planned. I've seen the film loads of times, but that Freddy Krueger still terrifies me, she shuddered. Anyway, did you have a nice meal? Lovely, thanks. My voice sounded a little robotic. Had I heard her right? As we walked across the drive together, I zoned out of her chat about horror films. Yasmin had only pulled out of Sam's meal this afternoon, but it seemed she'd been planning to let me down all week. How could she do that to me? Ariana was in the kitchen topping up two glasses of wine when I opened the door. Hey, Fizzy, how was your night out with your boss's family? I hated being called Fizzy, especially when Ariana managed to make it sound like an insult. And why did she struggle so much with the concept of having a positive working relationship and a friendship? It was awesome, thanks, I said in my brightest, bubbliest tone. How was your evening? The best. With a flick of her long chestnut hair, she swept past me. I followed Sarah Jade into the lounge, a warm smile pasted on my face. There was so much I wanted to ask Yasmin about tonight. I wouldn't embarrass her in front of her friends. There could be any number of reasonable explanations as to why she'd cancelled on me, then spent the evening with them, and we could discuss that when they'd gone. Only they didn't go. Sarah Jade said she'd had a nightmare week in her teaching role, and when she relayed the tale, Yasmin said she sounded like she could do with a drink, rather than driving home. So they were invited to stay over. Another bottle of wine was opened, but not being much of a drinker, I made a hot chocolate instead. They spent the rest of the evening reminiscing about their college days and the clubbing scene in Hull where they'd met Sarah Jade. Always considerate, Sarah Jade did her best to include me in the conversation. I laughed with them and threw in the occasional question to try and show my interest, but it wasn't easy being the outsider in a tightly knit group who'd known each other for 15 years. I didn't want to be the first to drift off to bed, but by midnight I was flagging and had to call it a night. I hovered in the doorway thinking Yasmin might at least roll off the sofa and kiss me goodnight. But all she did was say goodnight then launch into another anecdote. I tried not to take it personally. She wasn't one for demonstrations of affection in public. But a brief kiss or even just a hug in her lounge in front of her two best friends was hardly public. Every time I drifted off, a whoop of laughter from downstairs jolted me awake. After an hour or so, I was fed up of battling sleep, so I grabbed my phone and scrolled through the socials. Sam had uploaded photos from Crafty Hollow and the meal and tagged in her guests, thanking us for making her birthday so special. I scrolled through them, smiling. It had been a really great evening, 
as were all the get-togethers involving Sam's friends and family who'd always made me feel so welcome. I scrolled through the comments and spotted a post from Toby.